If you love the night sky, you'll want the Stargazer's Atlas. That's our text to nation. I'm Fred Fishkin. Joining us is Andrew Fazekas, author of the new National Geographic book, Stargazer's Atlas, The Ultimate Guide to the Night Sky. Hi, Andrew. Hi there. Well, congratulations on this really beautiful book. Uh, the photos and graphics, just beautiful text too. And these are exciting times, I think, for those who love astronomy, are they not? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we've got these amazing missions that are unfolding before our eyes, uh, whether you're watching on your digital device, uh, you know, uh, whatever it may be. Uh, it's incredible because you've got like asteroids being smashed, uh, telescopes showing us the the far corners of the universe. Uh, we're prepping to send humans back to the moon. Uh, things are happening uh, fast and furious in the astronomy world everywhere. And uh, this atlas is really sort of a companion, uh, you know, uh, at the on the coffee table sitting Sitting down uh, and and just taking your own personal journey across the universe and seeing how humanity is really connected to the cosmos at large. And this was put together, I'm assuming, uh, well before the Webb telescope came on online, right? And with, with the images we've been seeing from that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So what you're seeing now is a culmination with the with the James Webb telescope is a culmination of many years of of uh of prep work. Uh as is this this atlas too. I mean, it's over 2 years in the making and uh it kind of gives a, it's a great companion to things that folks are seeing unfold like those beautiful images in the James Webb telescopes, which by the way, a lot of those objects that you're seeing the, especially the ones of, of the, this past week with the pillars of creation, those are included. Those destinations are included in the Atlas where you can actually find them on the maps and find them in the sky where if you have a little backyard telescope or binoculars, you can track down many of these deep sky objects uh, that you hear in the news about. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Do everyday folks uh, have to spend a lot of money on telescopes to really enjoy astronomy? Not really. This is a fantastic hobby because it's um, you can start off completely free by just by using your eyes. The human eye is an amazing optical instrument that's designed to capture a lot of light in the overhead skies. It's the perfect wide angle lens uh, in being able to learn the night sky at first. It's the best instrument because you want to learn about where constellations are, these big maps, uh, pictures in the sky, connect the dots uh, just using your eyes. Take about 15 minutes to a half hour, uh, once or twice a week, uh, and you'll get acquainted very quickly with a handful of the brightest constellations. And those are the basic roadmaps for finding the treasures that are buried within, within each of those constellations. Then you can graduate to binoculars, which are maybe a good pair, would cost you anywhere from $75 to $200. Uh, and then uh, a telescope. Expect a small telescope to a good one that has a good steady rock mount, no shaking. So you get those nice crystal clear views anywhere from $200 to $500 investment you're talking about for a good standard telescope. And I highly recommend that folks, if they are interested in getting in, involved in astronomy, is seek out a local astronomy club. And those folks will be more than happy during a star party to show you uh, what telescopes are capable of and how they work. It's a, it's a great starting point. Terrific advice. You know, we love your enthusiasm here. So tell us more about your background and, and how you became interested in astronomy. Well, it started at a very young age. I must have been around four or five years old. It's one of my earliest memories of uh, we, uh, my dad taking me up to our uh, the apartment building where we lived at a large city, Montreal, Canada, huge, lots of light pollution. And <laughs> But he had a little department store telescope and he took me to the roof of the, uh, the building uh, on a regular basis, sit me on his lap and give me a tour of the, of, of the cosmos. We would see the moons of, uh, the, the moons of Jupiter uh, close up, the rings of Saturn, and of course, touring the craters of the moon. It just got me hooked at a very young age. I was all about space. And my dad really 
you know, kept feeding me, you know, that interest, making sure that it, it, that, that uh, flame kept uh, was kept alive. And here I am, decades later, sh having the wonderful opportunity of sharing my passion with folks. So basically getting people jazzed up about going out and learning the stars. You don't have to be a Stephen Hawking or a Neil deGrasse Tyson to enjoy the awe and beauty that the cosmos is. It's there for everyone. And even if you're in the city and there's lots of light pollution, you shouldn't shy away from it. You can see the the planets like Mars and Jupiter and Saturn, all that stuff is visible. And even the brightest stars that are the main guideposts and being able to learn how to navigate the night sky are visible within city limits. So uh, there's the, the access point is, is free. Uh, and uh, and it's really the sky's the limit of how far you want to take the hobby. And it's great to do alone or with groups of people and you you know with a family, especially if you have children to to be there and learn together. I love that the sky is the limit. Uh, there are always interesting events too, always it seems. Uh, and what are some of the upcoming astronomical events that we can be watching for? Yeah, so uh, by coincidence, today there's a partial solar eclipse across your, much of Europe. And uh, if, if you go on your digital device, you can follow along. It's happening uh, today. Uh, but uh, upcoming, really neat, this Friday, if you go out just after sunset and look towards the southwest, you'll see a very whisker-thin crescent moon that's going to be paired with an orange star. And that star is called Antares. It's 500. 150 light years away, and it's still one of the brightest stars in the sky. You're looking back in time 500 years when you're looking at that orange star next to that crescent moon. It's going to be a really eye-catching encounter between those two uh, those two uh, guys. So that's basically uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, I mean, tomorrow evening, Thursday, uh, the 27th, October. And then uh, later this uh, next month in November is the Leonid meteor shower peaking on November 17th and 18th. You can see anywhere from 10 to 20 shooting stars per hour. And then the granddaddy of all shooting star shows, mark this on your calendar, is December 13th. That's the when the geminid meteor shower peaks. This is even better than the summer perseids that we talk so much about. It's because it's winter time in the Northern hemisphere, people don't think about this shower, but it, it even surpasses it. You can expect anywhere from 60 to 120 shooting shooting stars per hour with the Geminid meteor shower. Again, that's mark your calendars, December 13th. You don't want to miss that. Just terrific. Well, again, it's the Stargazers Atlas, the ultimate guide to the night sky. Andrew Fazikas, thank you so much for spending time with us. My pleasure. Clear skies. <laughs>